Pierre told you that our idea is that for, especially for verbal material, we will have two mechanisms of maintenance or two systems of maintenance. And so one will be more an attentional demanding domain general mechanism that because it's domain general, it could also be used for verbal material and of domain specific material. And usually when you think about working memory, especially from the European British tradition, you mostly think about the phonological loop. And this is, oops, this is not it. Okay. Not Which way is it? The right one. Okay. So among the different study we did, uh, what we try to do is try to understand how the two systems coexist how they're going to interact. And so one of the first experiments we did, it was using the, this kind of device, similarly the same complex pen task in which participants maintain a series of letters. And between those letters, they have seen some digits, six digits, and they have two types of tasks to do on these digits. Either they have to do a relatively low demanding task, which is a target detection. I mean, they just press a key when they see five on screen which is relatively low demanding, or they have a much more demanding task, which is a sum verification, verifying that this third digit or the sixth and the sixth digit is the addition of the two previous ones. So this is the way we manipulate in actually the cognitive load. This is another way that we did not present it yet, but it's another way to manipulate the cognitive load. And in a cross design and um, orthogonally, we either ask participants to do this stack silently or to read the digit on screen, which is going to induce an articulatory suppression and block a possible phonological loop. We also co vary the pace to verify if this could affect the trend or the relationship between the two systems. And what we observe, or oh, it's the same, what we observe is that. Here you got the number of uh, letters they've been able to recall, and you have for slow and fast pace, we have exactly the same pattern, so it's quite resistant for that. And first you have the classic effect on recall of uh, the articulatory suppression. When people have to do something aloud, you have a reduction of recall, you can see in both. But also, we replicate another way of doing the cognitive load manipulation. I mean, when you do a task that is more demanding, you have this decline in performance at any time. This is significant, this is significant. But never, never, no interaction between the two manipulation. So this was the first idea that the two systems are really independent and do not uh, work or work independently on the memory trace. So if we have two systems, a central system that we know very well now is attentional demanding, and another system which is kind of like a phonological loop, this phonological loop is well known to be affected by the characteristic or phonological characteristic of the memory item to maintain. And one of the two big effects of the phonological loop is the phonological similarity effect and the word length effect. The phonological similarity effect is that it's more difficult to maintain series of words when they are phonological similar than dissimilar because it induces some phonological confusion if they are phonological similar. The other effect is the word length effect. If you have longer words to maintain, it's longer to rehearse, and then on a constant duration, you can only you going to rehearse less words than for short words. And then in this case, at the end, this phonological loop will only allow to maintain less long words than short words. So we, in the similar design, we also manipulate these two different factors by presenting either list, for example, in a first experiment, list of similar words versus list of dissimilar words. And we, once again, orthogonally vary the implication of the central system and of the phonological loop. We vary the implication of the attentional system by either having nothing to do, which is really the minimum cognitive load, the no cognitive load uh, condition, or to ask our participants to do a location judgment task. Here it's pretty difficult, <coughs> but the square are either up or down on screen, and it's very subtle difference. It really has participants to be very careful, and they have response by pressing keys. This is the manipulation of the cognitive load. And on the top of that, either they have a silent task, here it was silent, here it was silent, or they have to do an articulatory suppression, 
and to really control the pace of this articulatory suppression team to ensure that it's exactly the same amount in the different condition, they have to say yes, yes to a beep that gives them the rhythm to follow that. So here they only have to do an articulatory suppression and in the last condition they have to do the joint manipulation of concurrent articulation and a cognitive load effect or, or distraction of attention. So what we see here, we replicate the previous finding that is both the articulatory suppression induced reduction of recall performance in both cases, introducing a concurrent task is going to reduce recall performance. You have this difference is significant and this difference is also significant. But the most interesting thing in this experiment is that this political similarity effect, the difference between dissimilar and similar words, occur only when there was no articulatory suppression. I mean, in both when it was nothing to do or even if they have something to do but it's silence, you can observe this phonological similarity effect. As soon as you introduce an articulatory suppression, the phonological similarity effect disappears. But it disappears independently, you have all still an effect of the attentional demand, which fits with the idea that you have two systems that are independent, and when you can use the phonological loop, you are sensitive to the phonological similarity on the top of the effect of the attention on demand. And actually, when, you did this, when we did the same experiment manipulating the word length, presenting list of short words or list of long words, I actually really changed the slide. It's exactly the same finding. So the, the word length effect occur only when the task was silent, on the top, and additively to the manipulation of the attention on demand of the concurrent task which fits also nicely with this idea of having two independent systems and also with our idea that maintenance of verbal information is not just the job of the phonological loop of a domain-specific system, but there is really other way to maintain verbal information, which is more central. So we, we did a lot of things, uh, mostly in my lab, about this, showing that it's independence or that people can jointly use this. Adults can make also adaptive choice depending on the type of material you give an adult it will either use <coughs> he or she will either choose to use a phonological loop or the attentional system for example if you give an adult list of phonological similar words it's pretty stupid to use your phonological loop because you're going to introduce confusion and you can really see on the data they back up to an attentional system and then suddenly they become a sensitive to attentional, concurrent attentional demand. Uh, we also show that it's also lead by different type of representation, which just seeing for the phonological loop. I have some data showing that the central system is more on the semantic, they, they store more semantic representation. And others than us have shown that it's distant brain system, brain networks, mostly in uh, Master Johnson lab. Johnny just did a few things about that. There's two different networks that sustain this. So we have a few bits of evidence about this. So collecting all these things that we've done during the past 10 years or so, we try to integrate all this in a cognitive architecture. And this is the last version of a model. Uh, try to figure out how we can understand all this. And the idea is that you haven't the, all this is the working memory, kind of a center of the cognition for us. So you have here the representation, working memory representation, as Pierre say, built up like mental model. The idea is a transient representation built at the moment. And representation for us are only stored in this, in an episodic working memory buffer. And this system can only maintain a short amount of information, representation, probably around four, if we trust Nelson Cohen, but we quite trust him sometimes. <laughs> uh, then you have here four representations stored here. And those representations could be manipulated through a production system. Very, we, we are very inspired by Actar, John, John Anderson model. And so this production system could either rebuild, reconstruct, 
the representation, and this is the so-called storage function, which is actually a processing of reconstruction, or you process the information, which is really transforming, changing the representation. And it's all done by through this loop that the working memory representation will be manipulated by the production system, and this loop is what we call an executive loop that going to manipulate. The central system is here, and this is the central bottleneck, because when this loop is used for storage, it cannot be used for processing and vice versa. Beside that, you have what I just described, the fungical loop with a buffer and an articulatory rehearsal system, which is independent. We also uh, believe there is a visual spatial buffer, but without any domain-specific maintenance of the information. A motor buffer, we are quite unclear on that. It's really inspired by ACTAR. And a uh, goal module, sorry, it's not very clear, but the goal module is to direct the activity of this uh, executive loop. And also the idea that declarative long-term memory are going to feed to build up this representation. And it's something that we currently work on. So to just describe more the functioning of this, if you're more or less familiar with actor model is really built on that, the idea is that the current content or the working memory representation, this is two way of representing more or less the same things with two dif different design. The working memory representation are actually the condition of firing of a production rule, and the production rule will fire some executive function. Actually, executive function are the tools to transform the working memory representation. Transform or keep it as same, but it's just like a processing. So you have different rep you have different feature in the representation of the working memory that will feed the condition of the production rule. The condition rule will just fire, and then you have some action, and this action is made through executive function. So um, if I, just another way, once again, to represent that, you can see that through time, what's going on, you have a representation, it's going to be the condition of this production rule, firing an action, this action will act on the, will trigger an executive function and act on the working memory representation, which means that we have a new working memory representation. This new working memory representation will be condition of a new potential production rule that's going to fire another executive function that transform or rebuild the working memory, and so on and so forth. And this is why we call it an executive loop, because it's just like a loop but at the same time it's using the executive function and it's the idea that we do not have a central executive as in Badley, as most people know since undergrad, the way it works, but here you really don't have an homoculus, but the executive control is emergent from the functioning of this loop. And that's the idea we, come up. we try to proceed. So that means that executive function, uh, they are currently defined mostly in the neuropsychology literature, updating, shifting, inhibition, should be especially important in, um, or should mostly use this central, uh, this executive loop. They're going to impede, I mean, all. No, I can't find the English word for that. Um, they, they mostly involve this executive loop. So if you really want to impede the central bottleneck within a model, introducing executive function within a complex span task will be the best and the neat measure of the functioning of the executive loop because most of the function, you know, each time you do, I don't explain this correctly, but each time you have to do a processing, there is other you know, you have some motor activity that probably do not require attention so much. What is going to require mostly this ex central executive loop is the executive function. So if you want to have the cleanest measure of the functioning of the executive loop, it's, more, it's better to use a task that will involve a lot of executive function. So this is exactly what we tried to, or we did, is this, um, 
in this series of experiments, I'm going to wrap up a large series of study very quickly. Uh, but the idea here was always, so we have several experiments, and each time you have two conditions to compare. One so that will involve a, an executive function and a control one, very similar, but without executive control. And so this is going to help us to vary the implication of the central bottleneck on the different condition. I'm going to explain this but with an example. For example, the Stroop, everybody knows this one. You introduce a Stroop task within a complex pen task. Participants have to maintain digit while they have to name the color of the ink. Either you have this condition that would require to inhibit the reading of the words, which is inhibition one of the executive function, or you have a control condition in which we present an adjective, and so in this case they do not have to inhibit anything, they just read, it's name the color. Okay? So on each experiment, this is what we did. Another experiment with inhibition, you have once again Participants maintain words, this is words in French, or words in French, it's triage. And here you have to name or to enumerate how many objects on screen, but here it's digit and so it's going to be uh, more difficult. You have to inhibit to read the digit, and here it's letter, so you just have to say how many letters you see on screen. And so this is what we did for different tasks. For this one, for example, what we predict, the model predict, is that if you look at the bar, it's the response time on the first tile I showed you. When it's with adjective, it's shorter to respond to that color. It's the classic Stroop effect. And conversely, the number of items that participants can maintain is reduced in this condition because they introduce the use of the executive function, inhibition, and then impaired the functioning of the central, or this, not distract attention, yeah, distract attention or use for longer duration the central bottleneck or the, or the executive loop. We have the same for this second experiment. And so what we did in this large series of experiments, uh, we each time used this response time as an evaluation of how much this, this loop, the executive loop, was involved in the task is an estimation to, of this to have an approximation of the cognitive load. And our idea is that we should observe that the recall performance is directly predicted by this cognitive load. And actually, so you have the two experiments that I show you were in green, they are here. So we did this with several experiments involving updating, with response selection, with retrieval. And all these different tasks, if you bring this back to the same measure of a cognitive load, evaluating, evaluated by the sum of the response time divided by the total time, you can see that they nicely plot on the same line and we still have 2% missing where it goes nowhere. But it's quite nice, and this is exactly what we were predicting. And we think that we had such a nice design, nice result, because we mostly use this executive function, where especially used in the executive loop. If I have a bit of time, I can I just, yeah? I don't know, what time is it finished? Uh, oh. Yeah? OK. So just a few words about development. Because at the beginning, all this start by development. That was the question of how we can understand the development of working memory. So the first thing is, are we going to observe the same kind of relations between the cognitive load and the recall performance in children, which index this functioning of an executive loop? And so, as a first experiment, we use the same reading span task as we presented at, uh, Pierre presented at the beginning with, we can't really see here, but eight years old, 11 years old, and 14 years old. And we vary the number of digits per time they have to uh, read while they maintain letters. The first thing that you can see is that 
at 8, 11, 40, we still replicate this linear relationship between the cognitive load and the amount of information children were able to maintain. The second thing you can see, of course, I mean, sec the second thing is that eight years old recall less than the others, which is the thing to explain. But you see that the slope is go going steeper and steeper with age. And actually, adolescents got a about the same relation as what we observe in undergrad young adults. And the idea here is that because the, the mechanism of refreshing become more and more efficient or more and more used because functionally leads to the same prediction, it's mostly the oldest, the teenagers, that are more affected by the introducing a higher cognitive load. It's only those who are going to use the most this tool that refreshing is that are going to be more impaired when you distract attention and they cannot use this refreshing. And the younger kids, they're probably less using it or they're less efficient of using it and this is why they're less impaired in their recall when you distract the attention or when you impaired the mechanism of refreshing. The idea is next is that is there then an age you know if you start to think that the, the slope is becoming shallow and shallow when you go down on age is there an age on which there is absolutely no refreshing and in this case we start to study with other type of material five and seven years old manipul they have to maintain this time animals presented by picture and names and they have to name the color of smileys there were smileys here we vary the number of color presented by each uh, between each uh, animals either one color in 2000 milliseconds or two colors in 2000 milliseconds or two in 4000 the idea here is that if you compare the first one and the last one color in 2000 two color in 4000 it's the same cognitive load you have to do the same things so here and there, there's exactly the same cognitive load, but when you do two color in 2000, it's a higher cognitive load. And if children use refreshing, they should have lower recall performance here than in this two. Conversely, if you start to think of a child who's not going to have a refreshing mechanism, what would happen for a model? It will maintain the information, but they have nothing to refresh this information. Because we predict a time-based decline, it will then forget this information, and more you wait, lower will be the recall performance. So if there is no refreshing in some age group, we should see that the children should be affected by only the duration, and so those two who last the same should not differ, and this one should lead to a lower performance because it lasts longer. So, Here's the result, contrasting five and seven years old. Of course, there is a huge difference on their recall performance, but the pattern of result is really different. At seven, we replicate the cognitive load effect. The two conditions with the same cognitive load did not vary and, were bad, and the children had better recall performance than when they have a higher cognitive load, so exactly as the eight years old in the previous experiment. But for the five years old, it was totally different. The two conditions with the same duration did not vary, and when you increase the duration, you observe a reduced performance, as if, and this is what we think, the children did not have the use of refreshing, did not have or do not use refreshing, still to understand this question. Yeah, it's interesting if, if, if refreshing is, in some cases, uh, a kind of implicit reversal. This is exactly the age at which you see one, re one and two re word Spontaneously emerge in life recall. You mean verbally rehearse? Exactly. Exactly. It's exactly at the same age, but I do not think it's leading by the same type of, of mechanism. It's, and also, there's currently a lot of debate about this age of rehearsal that could appear before that. So, yeah, it's exactly at the same age. And this is ex the thing we're currently working on try to disentangle the effect of the two at the development level. Um, the last one is that our model could also make prediction about what will make the difference between two age groups. If you compare two age groups doing the same task, younger kid, older kid, the older kid, we know they're going to have a better recall performance. 
but on the same time, we know they are faster. So the processing is going to be shorter for them than for the younger. And because the processing, it's also how much they're going to forget, that's for sure one source of difference, and that could explain why the older have better recall performance. They also have shorter period of decay. The other thing is that because it's faster processing in older children, if you keep the duration constant, which is always this in experiment design, that means they're going to benefit, the older children benefit for longer period of refreshing. So they doubly benefit of this, they have lower decay, and they have more time to refresh. So at the end, that could explain why they have better recall performance. But overall, they have lower cognitive load. So what would happen if we are able to maintain and to control and equate these differences? So in this really neat series of experiments, uh, that's here, first of all, we contrast two age groups, 8 and 11, and on the first experiment, they did exactly the same task. Baseline, maintaining letters, and they have to add one to each digit, say 5, 8, and 3. And they do the same. And we have exactly the same presentation rate, present, and the gap between two digits, the duration was exactly the same. And of course, as we, we also manipulate, sorry, the different uh, duration here to vary the pace. We replicate the classic developmental differences that the older children are better recall performance than the younger, and we have a pace effect in both age groups. Now, when you measure the response time of adding one at 11 years old, it takes only, it takes nearly 400 milliseconds less than at 8 years old. So that means at 11 years old, they will have less decay, as I just said, and more time also to reactivate the information. So what we did is that we're going to do in the second experiment, asking the 11 years old to do another task that would last the same duration as for the 8 years old. And it happens that, oops, sorry. It happens if you ask 11 years old to do plus 2, it takes about the same duration as at 8 years old to add plus 1. So this way, you have this, the two tasks with the two processing, they last the same. And we replicate so the experiment this way. Um, to sake of uh, comparison, here you got the 11 years old in the first experiment. The 8 years old are here and the 11 years old of the second experiment. So you can see very clearly that when you start to ask 11 years old to do a task that lasts the same duration as the task for the 8 years old, you have a reduction of the difference between the two age groups and still pace effect on both. Okay. So, but there is still an age-related difference between the two. Why so? We just say that 8 years old are slower they have lower processing speed. So when they refresh, we can also believe that they refresh less fast or less efficiently, or they need more time to refresh the same amount of information as the 11 years old. So what we did in a pretest, we use several different tests to measure processing speed and to know what was the relationship between the processing speed at 8 years old compared to 11 years old. That means, if you read this graph, that means here, at when you are 11 years old, things you need 1,000 milliseconds, needs 1,400 milliseconds if you're 8 years old. Okay? That's the way you can read it, because they are slower. So we can tell her the time for refreshing to the 8 years old. We can give 8 years old the same amount of time that they should need to perform the same job as an 11 years old for the refreshing. And so using this function, you can use this and then replicate once more this task. Here, 11 years old, they do the plus 2. Here, they do plus 1, so same duration of the processing. But here, the gap that is available, or the time that is available to refresh, 
you give more time to the eight years old, and this time is stellar to the processing difference between the two age groups. One small sake of comparison, you have the eight years old here from the previous experiment, and as you can see here, you have now no more age effect. It totally vanished between the two age groups, and you still have a pace effect. So if we recap this, if you ask two age groups to do the same task, obviously you have an age-related difference that is quite large. When you start to just first equate the processing time, this difference reduces, but if you equate the processing time and give to the younger a time that is tailored to the processing speed, the difference disappears. So for us, this really pinpoint on the different source, potential different source of difference on development to understand the working memory development. It's probably not the entire story. We don't think that you know, it's so simple. It's two age group between 8 and 11. Of course, we don't think that if you do it between uh, 7 years old and 20, you're going to vanish everything like this. There's also strategy and type of maintenance mechanism and knowledge that people can use that it's going to be involved. So if I recap this talk, it's clear. I mean, I hope we convince you that time is an important uh, parameter to understand the functioning of working memory and I would even say cognition, <laughs> but clearly. We show there is a processing storage trade-off that is time-based. There's also the idea that there is a central interference uh, that means here this loop, this executive loop, will be the source of this central interference between the verbal and visual spatial processing, and it's totally different from the classic Badley's idea of domain-specific uh, mechanism. We bring some evidence that this is a temporal decay, and Pierre showed you this, of in working memory, and there is two systems of maintenance specific for verbal maintenance, or the maintenance of verbal information, and we don't find any evidence of this for the visual spatial information, and we also show that times is an important factor if we want to understand the working memory development. And so this, this is the last version of our model that we publish in this book that recap and brings more thought about how we see the world in general of our working memory. And this could be only done because we have plenty of people around us that do this experiment and they uh, belong to this different lab. And in case you don't know, Switzerland is this tiny spot here. And uh, Pierre is in the University of Geneva here. I'm in the University of Fribourg. And this is one of our favorite spots. And this is lovely inhabitant of Switzerland. <laughs> Thanks a lot for the invitation.